Okay, give me a second here. The slides aren't advancing. Here we go. Here's a quote from Paul Simon. Grow and mature with you, follow you right up on until you die. Uh, there's actually a little bit more of that quote, but Paul Simon was talking about uh, the fact that uh, with music, you can mature, it grows with you as you get older, you look at different kinds of music. Of course, he wasn't talking about me. Uh, I'm still uh, listening and collecting the, the music of my, my youth. Now, this is gonna be a two-part presentation. Uh, first part will be a quick review of our music listening habits during the last 65 years. Uh, most of us probably were alive during that period, so I think hopefully you'll remember uh, some of the things we're going to point out today. And then uh, we're going to look at the today's downloading and streaming offerings and how those uh, work and operate. So before 1948, the phonograph goes back to the 19th century Thomas Edison, and uh, that led to the development of the 78 RPM record. And really, during the first half of the 20th century, consumers could choose what music they wanted to listen to at home. For the first time that they had a choice. And that particular format stayed around for years and years. But it was a format that had a need for improvement. Uh, those of us that remember 78 RPM records, they were actually made of shellac. They're not vinyl, and so therefore they could easily chip or shatter. Uh, due to the weight of the tone arms on early players, the recording grooves, and really that affected the sound quality, would deteriorate after many plays. Some consumers would add to this problem by taping a coin to the tone arm to help reduce skipping. That sound familiar to anyone? Let's take a look and listen to how the 78 sound. Look how that platter just flops down. Today we are so careful when placing uh, records on the turntable, but not in the old days. So they're not hearing it, Ray. No? Not, oh, okay. You didn't check the box, but we, we can go on. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna jump ahead. Uh, David tells me that we're not uh, getting the sound of the, the videos. There's a, one other one later on that I may have to adjust. Okay, ever wonder why records are called albums? Well, back in the early days, again, in the days of the 78s, uh, 78 maybe had the ability to hold about five minutes of music. Uh, so if you wanted to buy an hour long symphony, uh, that music had to be put on multiple 78 RPM discs. So the manufacturers and the record producers put them together in something that looked like a photo album, and lo and behold, they called it a record album. Uh, so the, amazing that the uses of the word album with respect to these sound recordings continues right up until today in the 21st century as uh, I can have a friend who said, hey, Dre, I just bought this new CD, this new album. So that terminology has continued. So here's what an old 78 RPM record album looked like. They actually called it record album on the front cover. And as you open it up, you could see where the different uh, 78 RPM platters were, were all sorted and had their own little sleeves. And then on the side, you could actually have a record index where you could write in the information about the, the particular record. So before I go on to too much more with respect to devices that were used for music, let's not forget about the radio. Record players were expensive and uh, many people just couldn't afford a record player, but pretty much before 1948, everybody could afford a radio and almost all the households in America had it. And after you paid that initial cost, the music was free. The, biggest advantage of radio, listening to music on the radio, was all types of music was available for all kinds of listeners. Those of us old enough to remember before the 1960s, uh, we lived in a very segregated America and phonograph records played on the radio were available for all to hear. 
only depended on where you decided to stop when turning the dial. So in a small way, radio helped equalize the social classes. Both the poor and the rich could hear the great vocalists. White listeners could listen to black music without fear of any kind of uh, uh, violating current day norms. And then in the mid 1950s, particularly in large urban cities, many a young white teenager laying in bed at night had a uh, transistor radio tucked under the pillow so the parents wouldn't know and listening to the uh, transition of what was then black R&B into the earliest days of rock and roll. And if you want to know more about that, just ask me. Okay, format wars. You know, we talk about format wars today uh, with respect to VHS versus beta and more recently the Blu-ray versus uh, HD, DVD. Well, format wars have been going on for a long, long time. And uh, when the changeover became from, from making records out of shellac to vinyl, uh, we had the LP long playing album come out. That came out in 1948 uh, by the Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS. And this was their entree into replacing uh, the decades old 78 RPM format. Now at the time, Columbia's arch rival RCA Victor was the largest record label for distributing 78 RPM records. So this was a direct hit at competing against RCA. So what were some of the benefits of uh, the long playing album, 33 and a third RPM over the 78 of the day? Greater sound, uh, sound fidelity and sound quality, for sure. Uh, it weighed less, far less breakable. And by playing at a slower speed, that 12 inch disc, as compared to the 10 inch 78, could have as much as 22 minutes of music per side. So now RCA was being challenged. What are they going to do? Well, the 45 RPM record gets released a year later. This we all know as the, the little disc with the big hole in the middle. So RCA wanted to compete, uh, also using vinyl as the material. Uh, to compete against the LP introduced its format in 1949. Uh, RCA Victor had an advantage here in that they also made the record players and could sell them at cost to entice new buyers. And the benefits of a 45 over an LP, uh, about three minutes of playing time on each side. So that's perfect for what was called pop music of the day or as most of us who live back east, like I did when I was a kid, it was called hillbilly songs. And uh, this was the perfect size for that. And also, uh, this was the perfect size to start to replace the 78s in the nation's jukeboxes, which of course were very, very popular back in the day. Okay, how many of you out there still have your 45s? Uh, this is just a small portion of them, the ones that I will use as frequently as I can, and I try to keep them somewhat organized uh, in alphabetical order by artist. So today, uh, the younger generation millennials talk about playlists. Well, when I was a kid, this is how I made a playlist. Anybody else can relate to this? So eight-track tape arrives, have music, will travel. And uh, unintended results here. Believe it or not, Bill Lear of the Lear Jet Company in 1965 wanted to develop a player for his planes. And he came up with the concept of the eight track player. And when he was done, he said, hey, I think these could work in cars. And the, the, you know, the rest is history. Uh, they were initially manufactured by a Ford, a Ford company, Ford Motor Company affiliate. And so the name Motor Victrola, Victrola being the old fashioned name for a turntable, Motor Victrola was uh, turned into Motorola Corporation. Now, I'm not sure, uh, again, we're having the issue with uh, sharing the sound. Uh, I'm gonna start this, but uh, if you can't hear it, 
then I'll then I'll move on. But uh, if nothing else, I'm going to let it go until he actually inserts the eight track cartridge into the car player, just to rem remember what that looks like. You're not getting any sound right. No. Okay. Give me another 30. There we go. That's that's the, what the eight track looks like. He has a Peter Paul and Mary eight track and plugs it in and now the sound has changed. But again, my fault on this end, uh, you're not getting that sound. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay. The compact cassette came along next and actually the cassette compact cassette was available even before the eight track, but I remember it uh, being used in, in office environments uh, mom strictly for dictation because the sound quality, there was a lot of tape hiss and noise, and it really wasn't good for uh, recording music at that time. But uh, fast forward about 10 years, and the Dolby Corporation comes out with the introduction of the Dolby B tape noise reduction system. They went on to Dolby C and a couple of other Dolby levels above that. And this eliminated the, the tape noise or the hiss. And now you could take a recording and uh, create one on a cassette tape with a fairly high quality of sound. And this made uh, it become a, a serious format for recording music. Uh, I'm always amazed at the staying power of the cassette. Uh, home decks became popular where consumers could now take their records and uh, be able to create tapes and take the tapes uh, with them on portable players and that's where the term the, the mixtape came from putting the songs they liked on a tape. Likewise uh, continuing improvements in this tape quality other features uh, the compact cassette is was still around at the beginning of this century. Uh, you took a, take a look at any of the cars from, say, 2001, 2003, and they have cassette players in them. So this was a credible staying power for this particular format. And about that time was the Sony Walkman. How many of you had at least a Sony Walkman? 1979 is when the, that unit started and it sold over 200 million units. A smaller size, not by today's standards, but by the standards of the 1970s and early 80s, uh, was considered very small. And I can remember seeing people jogging and doing other outdoor activities with a uh, Walkman uh, attached to their uh, to their shoulder. So uh, Sony's lead helped the cassette tape outsell vinyl records for the first time in 1983. So that was the beginning of the, the of vinyl records on its downward spiral. And the popularity of the Walkman between 87 to 97 was when it was most popular. And, uh, but then when the compact disc came out, the cassette format began to fade. Amazingly, uh, Sony really used that Walkman nameplate over and over. And uh, even into the 2000s, uh, there were MP3 players and, and portable DVD players. They all had the, the name uh, Walkman associated with them. And that was music portability before the iPod. Then came the compact disc. And uh, going back to the mid 70s, Sony and Philips were working jointly in a, in a research and development and realized that optical disc technology was the wave of the future. As I recall it, when CDs first came out in the early 80, early to mid 80s, uh, they were expensive, $25, $30 for a one CD, and uh, all you could find was classical music. But the first pop album on CD was in 1982, Billy Joel's 52nd Street. And within the next year, there was just a massive ability by the record companies and the manufacturers to put out all their old albums on, on CDs. And uh, even if you had the record album at home, you wanted to get the great sound quality of a CD and you went out and we, we all bought, re-bought music that we already owned. 
and I was on a mass level. And now we're coming up, uh, you know, to uh, the what thirty uh, years later, and uh, so from 1985, Dire Straits had the first artist to sell a million CDs. Uh, the CD R and R W came out in the early 90s, and now people could record CDs at home on home equipment. And starting in 2008, though, sales for CDs started to drop. And that was because of the popularity at that point of music downloads. It's still a popular format, but since that time, CD sales have continued to decline each year since. I have a few CDs in my house here. Uh, it took me quite a while to, to rip all these and make them into digital files on my computer, but it's the only way I can keep them organized. The iPod, wonderful invention, Apple Music, leads the way to the popularity of portable music players. Uh, huge explosion, to everybody wanted to get an iPod to be able to carry their music with them. And uh, first came out in October of 2001. And the simplest way to explain what an iPod is, it's an iPhone without the phone, but it has all the other features of an iPhone. Uh, that led to the development of Apple's iTunes and then other similar type of software, providing the ability to transfer not only songs, but photos, videos, any kind of really a digital data to these portable devices so you could take that with you. And this also led to the advent of compressing music files. So consumers could create pretty large music libraries and without using up large amounts of uh, what at the time was pressure storage cap capacity. Today, uh, we take for granted the ability to have, you know, two gigabyte, um, two terabyte drives, four terabyte drives and bigger, but it was only uh, 10 to 15 years ago that uh, storage space was really at a premium. So MP3 audio is um, the ability to compress the music and uh, make your entire collection portable. What does an MP3, what does MP actually stand for? Well, it's a, it's a unit, an audio compression unit of the motion pictures expert group family standards. So in the motion picture industry, they have a variety of standards as to how they create not only audio, not only video, but audio as well. And so the MP3 standard is a, a compression standard. And basically it'll take and compressed to roughly 10% the size of an original audio recording file. So if you had a, an audio recording that was say 50 megabytes, as say a WAV file or lossless, it, once it's converted to an MP3, it's about five megabytes. So you're able, and there is a loss of sound quality. I often say only your dog can notice it, but, uh, if you talk to audiophiles, uh, they who look for the high-end stuff, uh, they will disregard the MP3 and they opt for, and the term today is called lossless recordings that give the full fidelity of the sound. And that's typically what you find on a, a commercial store-bought CD. Okay, portable MP3 players. Uh, now you have those available to you, thousands of songs. And uh, these were very popular, not only the iPods, but many other different companies uh, utilized and, and came out with a variety of MP3 players. But all of a sudden, uh, the ability to carry the music was now available on a smartphone, whether it be an iPhone or Androids or even Windows phones. And uh, so the concept of having to carry around a separate mp3 player most people were just as content as could be to have all that music on their on their smartphone uh, data music discs created at home you can uh, store hundreds of mp3 song files on a disc to be played mostly in car cd players uh, starting in the early 2000s most new cars, the CD players, and you'll see they have the initials MP3 on them, means you can take one disc, put a couple of hundred songs on it, 
and uh, play that in your car so you have one CD to take with you, not a whole bunch on a long trip. And many people don't realize this, but a MP3 disc, uh, while most older CD players will not play them, all home DVD players will be able to play an MP3 disc. So just put the MP3 disc in your home DVD player and you can have that music uh, for hours and hours playing in the house. But where we moved on to now is many more modern cars. So my, I have a 2008 Ford Taurus and I, that one has a USB connector. So I'm able to put on a flash drive, uh, thousands of songs and uh, just pop that flash drive into the USB connector in the car and I can play songs from here to, to driving to New York and back and probably never play the same song twice. Okay, then came the advent of digital downloads. And this is another vehicle that was replacing CDs. And uh, if you looked at the, um, should have turned that off. If you look at uh, both Nielsen and Billboard, uh, digital music purchases for the first time in 2011 accounted for more than 50% of music sales. So around 2011, people were realizing um, they could download the music rather than actually buying a CD. And in 2012, those digital sales were up over physical sales which were of CDs, which were continuing to decline. And uh, you know, iTunes stores, the Amazon Music, and others flourished, replacing purchasing music from brick and mortar locations. What are the benefits of a digital download? Well, look, you can purchase only the songs you want to, you want, while not ending up with tunes you rarely play. Uh, how often does that happen? Whether it was a CD or even buying LPs back in the day, uh, you might have heard a song that was played on the radio, you really liked it, I gotta go out and get that song, you bought the whole album, and out of 10 or 12 songs, maybe only four or five you liked. Uh, but yet you had to have them all. Well, digital downloads are more economical because you only pay for the songs that you want. And most services allow you to listen to a, a 30 second clip of a song before deciding if you wanna make the purchase. And then, um, this was really a, a benefit to new artists. They were able to showcase their work uh, without the need for a full album. Keeping your music in the clouds. So uh, there are now several cloud music services and uh, they allow you to upload your entire music collection. Uh, most of them will give you some storage capacity for free, uh, but then once you go over a certain amount, you have to pay a, a monthly fee. Um, services, again, like iTunes uh, and others will match. So if you upload a particular song from your collection that's at one quality level and the service has a the same song at a higher quality version, uh, they will swap that for you so you're getting the very best sound quality. And then you're able to have that music available on a number of devices. So you can have it on, uh, a phone, maybe you have a spouse that has a phone as well. Uh, you might have other portable devices. So this gives you the availability to have that service uh, to a number of, of devices. And some of the music services, uh, Google provides it. Again, if you have Android phones and tablet, uh, that's probably the best service. Amazon, which I like, uh, because I can purchase, I still like to purchase a CD, call me old fashioned, but I still like to have the physical uh, item in my hand. But when I purchase it from Amazon, they immediately download all the MP3 files of those songs. So I had them available immediately, yet I still have a, a, a CD that I can add to my collection. iTunes Match, best for the uh, users of the of, uh, Apple products and the iPhone. And then Groove Music, which you'll see on your Windows 10 operating system, and that's replaced the, the Xbox that was on 8.1 and 8. Uh, and Groove Music uh, is uh, another example of a music service. That's the one I typically use. Uh, it's about $10 a month and uh, have access to multiple songs, which I'll talk about next. So just a quick recap of the online music services. We have the online streaming, 
where basically you rent the music versus an online music store where you purchase and own the music. So for online streaming, uh, two levels. First, uh, you might choose the genre or an artist you like, and the service then chooses what songs to play. And because it's free, uh, they don't allow you to skip no, normally no more than six songs per hour because uh, uh, they, they really are using this as an enticement. So you'll go to the next level where for about $10 a month, uh, you can choose any artist, any genre, any particular specific song and uh, have them played on, the, on, the, on, on your devices. Uh, the online music store where you actually purchase the music uh, gives you the ability to purchase and download the music to save it on your computers and other devices. Songs can range anywhere from 99 cents to $1.99. Not all stores offer the highest quality downloads and none that I've been able to see can offer all the music ever recorded. I'm not even sure what that number is. So, um, there are so many new online music services coming out that I've basically given up trying to keep track of all of them. But if you go to uh, Wikipedia uh, and you just type in their search box, uh, online music services, uh, you'll see the listing of all that are current. And these uh, pretty much uh, come and go. There's many that have come out, many from other countries, not just the US, and they'll last for a while and then just disappear. So some of the names of online streaming services, you know, Google Play, Pandora. Pandora is one of the more popular ones. Uh, you just go to pandora.com, type in the name of an artist, and immediately you can have for free music playing in, in the background. Uh, Rhapsody is also one that doesn't get as much attention, but they've been around a long time. Spotify is very popular. I mentioned Groove a minute ago, part of uh, Microsoft. Uh, there's a couple of others. Title is the uh, a new service, new maybe six months ago it came out, and it cost about twice as much for the monthly rate as the other services, but their push is that it offers a much higher quality of sound. So time will tell whether or not uh, individuals are willing to pay more for a higher quality sound. My prediction is no. I think most people are happy with the, the other services, and if they can save $10 a month, they will. And then again, you have the online music stores like Amazon, uh, Google, iTunes, Rhapsody is a, is a store as well, and, and, and Groove Music. So what are the, some of the advantages of, of a music streaming service? You have access for the $10 a month, and you have a favorite song, uh, you can just go in, type the name of that song, and then you see a list of all the other artists who perform that song. Uh, I've always liked Rags to Riches by Tony Bennett, one of his trademark songs. But when you look and see, you'll see that the Dominoes, which had uh, Jackie Wilson on lead, uh, with a phenomenal version of Rags to Riches. So it's just a way of expanding your music to see how many other people have done a song that you really like. Uh, or the reverse of that, how many songs of a favorite artist where you thought, I have every song this artist ever did, and bingo, now you see that there's many, many others. And this it provides an introduction to new artists that otherwise uh, you might have never heard of. Uh, and as I said a minute ago, access to millions of recorded music songs. Millions and millions. I don't know what the number is. It's, it's, it's enormous. There are disadvantages. So the free services, like I mentioned before with Pandora, uh, they have limitations on the music you can hear. Uh, you have to have an internet connection. And if you're not using your Wi-Fi, then this takes on using your monthly data allotment. Now, I've talked to uh, some of the folks at Verizon, and you know they tell me uh, you'd have to be using this 24 hours a day, seven days a week over uh, a month, and it might use uh, one gigabyte. So they're, they're telling me it doesn't use that much, but I don't know of any way to actually measure that to find out how true that is. 
uh, the millennials, they love music streaming. These younger music lovers, uh, they don't go out and purchase CDs anymore. Uh, they don't even do digital downloads anymore. Uh, they, are, they either get the free service or they'll pay for the $10 a month service and have access to the music that way. And um, so they basically, uh, are, they're, rent, they're renting the music. That's what I call it. Instead of buying the music, they're renting the music from these online services. And this gives them the ability to form a personalized internet radio. And they'll create their own specialized playlist. It may be sorted by the music, by the genre of the music, the tempo, the artist. I know people who have uh, their favorite songs and or their songs to put them in a good mood or if they're feeling melancholy, they, they could just create playlists to suit their mood. So think about it. The uh, major benefits include no need to worry about storage issues, damaging a disc, theft, uh, how many of us have moved over the years and uh, each time we move carting our collection and that's sometimes the, we, we're moving to a place that can't handle it and we've lost access to some of the music. If you have everything uh, as music streaming and in the clouds, you don't have that to worry about. So to me, the immediate future of music listening uh, will continue to be digital downloads. That, I'm sorry, the digital downloads are continually going to fall while the free and the paid music streaming revenue will keep growing. And that's been confirmed by the Recording Industry Association of America, RIAA. And as streaming music subscriptions rise, digital music sales are declining. And the concept and the thought is if you have a music streaming service, do you really need to buy a digital album? Millennials will probably say no. I tend to say yes, because I'm still a collector at heart. So that leads to this question I love to pose. Can you still be considered a collector if you do not buy the music? So when I ask millennials in particular, they'll say yes, I'm still a collector. I still use playlists to organize the music. I can do it by genre or by artist or by other categories. Uh, just as someone who physically owns the media and, and organizes it. They say yes because uh, they take the same care, maybe more, with keeping their music organized. And they refer to the playlist that they create as a collection of the music uh, that they care about. However, when I ask that same question to some older folks, they say, no, you can't be considered a collector if you don't buy the music. You don't own the media as you do with CDs or vinyl records or, or even downloads. And due to the digital rights protections, you're not able to copy the music to play it elsewhere. And the word collector implies that you own something while paying a monthly fee and for you are renting. So this, uh, this is an argument, I think, and discussion that'll go on for a long, long time. LPs, are they taking us back to the future? What do I mean by that? Well, in the first half of 2014, sales of vinyl records were way up uh, compared with only 2.9 million for the first half of 2013, an increase of 40%. And during this time, CDs and digital albums were down. Now, don't get your hopes up you vinyl lovers of the past, because despite their double digit growth, it's still, you know, vinyl still makes up only 3% of total album sales. But uh, some of us still uh, are not ready to give up their, their LPs. Uh, on, but on the something new side, uh, many new artists today, there's Megan Trainer, I'm holding up her album with a white vinyl, uh, have offer their new releases either as digital downloads, CD, or on vinyl. Now, I'll warn you, the vinyl is a little bit more expensive, but it's a really high quality, very, very thick uh, vinyl, and uh, pretty nice to have that. So if, uh, for special music that I'm buying lately, uh, I might go and spend a few extra dollars and get uh, something uh, that ultimately I hope will become a collector's item. So you can have your cake and eat it too. 
So if you're going to have to buy a modern phonograph today, uh, you'll find that the, in the old receivers, they had uh, a, a higher amplification phono connection. You cannot hardly ever find that on any of the newer phonographs. Uh, I'm sorry, on the newer receivers. So what happened is the newer phonographs uh, give you the ability to plug it into a regular RCA jack, the red and white terminals, or a phono connection. Either one they'll work with. And uh, with this turn, to the newer turntables, they come with a USB cable connected to the phonograph and allows you to connect that to your computer. And then you record the songs in real time as MP3 files. It'll take a while, but if you have certain albums that are not, you found that you cannot find a digital copy, or you just don't want to spend the money, you're satisfied with that. Using a turntable like this, you're able to easily convert your vinyl into digital. And many of the new record albums, uh, like the one I showed you of Megan Trainer there, they contain a one-time use code that allows you to download for free all the songs on the album as MP3 files. So uh, you don't even have to go through this process uh, on the newer vinyl that's purchased. So uh, this, some of the services that you might want to try, examples of cloud music, Pandora. Uh, it's uh, pandora.com. Just go to that website and uh, type in the name of an artist or type in the name of a song and it will automatically start playing that. Usually it plays exactly what you ask for the first time. And then after that is where Pandora starts to decide what they think is similar music. And this is the one service that for free, uh, you can play, uh, you can, you don't like the next song, you can skip it, you can skip the one after that, but it only allows you to skip up to six songs per hour. I'm um, giving you a, an example of Groove Music, uh, $10 per month. And that's the streaming service uh, that comes with Windows 10. And that's where you do specify. You tell it, I want to hear this particular song or this particular artist. And you have access to millions and millions of songs. And many people, uh, like myself, are Amazon Prime members. So if you're a Prime member, uh, they'll give you free storage for up to 250 songs and then uh, unlimited music streaming. So that's a very nice benefit and feature of uh, the Amazon Prime. Okay, what are we going to see in the next decade for our music listening habits? I predict that streaming will continue to expand as the younger generation continues to move away from physical recordings and they become completely satisfied with online streaming. They're going to let somebody else worry about all the storage issues and uh, taking care of their collection. And for those like me that appreciate the extras that come with physical media, things like liner notes, pictures of the artist, uh, detailed track information, lyrics in particular, because so how often can you not understand some of the lyrics? I think they're going to become much easier to download and keep on your computer. Uh, no more paper copies. Uh, you'll be able to download this kind of uh, detail and to keep that as part of your digital song. And then dramatic improvements in streaming sound quality uh, with lossless ultimately replacing MP3, uh, but most won't be able to tell the difference. And then finally, uh, devices in the, ho the home and car that will play songs from the cloud that you verbally request. So those of you that have the Amazon Echo at home know you can just tell Alexa what song you'd like to hear and she'll play it from you. And then the Microsoft Sync system in automobiles uh, already has that type of voice activated feature where you can uh, just tell the Microsoft Sync system either what song you want or what album you want played that's stored on say an MP3 in your car and it'll automatically play it so you don't have to take your hands off the steering wheel and you can keep your eyes on the road. All right, uh, that's the main part of the, this presentation that's done. Uh, David, I'll leave it up to you. If there are any questions out there, I'll see if I can answer them. Okay. Uh, hopefully David is still listening there. OK, 
Okay, while I'm waiting for David to come back, I'll go to the one last slide, the little background information uh, myself. David has uh, talked about a little bit before, but I was born and raised in New York City, born in the Manhattan, raised in the Bronx. I moved to California for about uh, 23 years and got the opportunity to meet some like-minded musical friends and we all helped create an organization called the doo -Wop Society of Southern California. And that was uh, so much fun because I got the uh, opportunity to help produce live quarterly stage shows, very, very similar to the ones that every once in a while are shown on uh, PBS and got to meet a lot of my boyhood idols. And now I'm with APCUG as a director and treasurer, president of my local computer club in Pace in Arizona. I teach some uh, computer courses at the local community college. And another fun group is called RCA, which stands for Record Collectors of Arizona. And this is a group of uh, guys and a couple of females, and they meet bi-weekly and we play records and CDs and talk about the early days of rock and roll. Thank you very much, Ray Baxter. This is Jerry Menick, and uh, I'm gonna fill in for David for a second. Uh, maybe he's just out uh, getting a short break. But we had a couple questions, and one that I thought was interesting, uh, Ray, was the fact that somebody said, how do you listen to radio on your computer? Well, um, most of the radio stations today have a website. And uh, so you go to their website, and then usually on that home page, uh, there'll be a little box that says, listen now. And if you click on listen now, uh, it'll then tune you in via the internet to whatever is happening on that particular station. And what's great about this concept, uh, there's a Fordham University in the Bronx, New York, has a show every Saturday night that uh, I, is really to my liking. But normally it's on a, at a time that I'm not easily available to listen to. So uh, there's a software that you can buy that allows you to, it'll, it'll automatically you keep your computer on at that time it connects to that particular internet site records the station and then disconnects when that that particular program is over and then I, the next day i can get up and listen to it at my convenience but almost every radio station today on their website has the ability, ability to listen live okay. well, that's, that's great yeah i'm i'm back and you said i can you hear me now oh we I can, can hear you now. yeah Okay, no, I, uh, I just went and looked at my microwave, plugged into the computer, and one of the wires popped out. So we got to get that fixed. But uh, also, as I said, there's several things, iHeartRadio and some other things you can uh, subscribe to or get to free to allow you to listen to radio stations. Then there was another very interesting question, Ray, which I would like to hear the answer about, too. And it's, in your opinion, which... Um, what do you think is the start of rock and roll? What would be your choice to be the very first recording that could be called, be called rock and roll? Excellent question, excellent question. Uh, is, uh, I'd like that person to, to, if they want to send me the email and you can use my email address at my local club, ray at pacaonline.net. But uh, there's so many that fall into that category. The earliest ones come out about 1951. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think, uh, 60 Minute Men by the Dominoes was 1951. And when you think about that, that's way before uh, what rock and roll. But to me, that song has all of the qualifications of, a, of an early rock and roll song. Of course, you know, the more popular ones were when the solo artists like uh, Elvis was on the scene and uh, particularly his first songs on, on RCA when he, after he moved from Sun Records, like Heartbreak Hotel. Uh, that was what the, the general public got to like. Crossover songs, Why Do Fools Fall in Love by Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers became a, a, a huge hit. Shaboom by The Chords, another big crossover. These songs in, in a segregated America at the time normally were only played on black stations and on black charts, but these were the beginning songs of rock and roll that moved into the, into the white radio stations, thanks mostly to white teenagers who just love the music. 
Very good. Now the last question, because we do have a second or two. What is the name of some recording software that uh, you would suggest that people use, Ray? Um, I've recorded, well, I, I use, uh, when they say recording software, when I take a CD and I copy it to my computer, uh, I typically am very satisfied with Windows Media Player. Uh, and that gives me the ability to make changes in the settings for the uh, bit rate and, and things like that to get the, the best uh, quality. Uh, I found that uh, when I, I have a, a much larger collection now and Windows Media Player likes to do a lot of updating and it's, uh, it slows it down. So the one I use now is called Media Monkey. And there's a free version, which gives you so many options. And then there's a paid version, which provides even more features. But uh, Media Monkey is probably my favorite uh, software that I use to uh, rip CDs and use it for just keeping my music organized. Very good. Take it away, David. OK, can you hear me now? I can. Okay, good. I had to switch microphones. The other microphone, which is my old head stand standby, broke a wire. Okay, uh, that's the only thing. Oh, the software you use. Okay, there was one uh, talk about the replay music to record. Uh, there yeah. are a couple out there that we do that. Right, yeah, yeah, Applian, A-P-P-L-I-A-N is the company that makes replay music and a, a whole bunch of other software that, uh, that's the one I was talking about where I can set the recording to uh, record unattended and uh, they have the, the several software programs for video as well. Yeah, um, yeah, there, there are a couple out there that are good on that too also. Um, so as I said, I don't see any more questions, but if you think of a question, uh, feel free to put it in chat and we'll make sure that Ray answers it. And I want to thank Ray for a very excellent presentation. He can stop sharing his desktop. Jerry will go back to playing that music we love so much. And uh, we'll be back at the top of the hour with our final uh, presentation of the afternoon. So uh, take it away, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. For